Friends, this is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Friends, I'd like to just say that Reverend Joya and I have had a long 16, 17 months parenting small children and pastoring a church. And so we are looking at August as sort of a time of rest and preparation for our kickoff in September. Therefore, we will be doing our entire worship online through the month of August. There will not be in-person worship. And we will be reusing some clips that we have already generated so that we don't need to create more work for ourselves during this time so that we can plan ahead into the fall and be rested and ready to go. I know you will all understand. So as I will be reusing this clip week to week, I want to remind you that the best way to stay up to date with all of the things that are happening in the life of the church is to read your e-news. If you have any questions, you can certainly call the office. And if you need to reach out to Reverend Joy or I, except for when we are on vacation, we happily will return your emails and voice calls. Um, we are still mostly working from home, so please keep that in mind. If you leave a message on our office voicemail, it's probably best to um, reach out via email as well. Friends, our God loves us. Our God wants us to rest. Our God wants us to find restoration in him. And so let us all join together today and every day this month as we worship our God in joy and in thanksgiving. Good morning, good morning. It is so good to be back with everyone. I hope everybody's doing okay. I hope everybody's feeling okay. I hope everybody's as healthy as you can possibly be. And I hope that everyone is soaking up these last couple weeks, days, minutes, seconds of summer break before heading back to school. You know, I have to admit that a few months ago, I thought I'd be feeling very different right about now. I thought we'd be almost at the end of the COVID tunnel. I thought we'd be feeling much more relaxed and reassured and getting much closer to normal. But instead, I have to admit, I'm feeling pretty anxious, a bit nervous, a bit scared because there's so much I don't know about what's to come. There's a lot more that I don't know than what I feel like I do know. You know, sometimes I wonder if I'm strong enough, do I have the strength to do it again? To go through another year like the last one we had? I brought something with me today. You know what this is? It's a piece of wood. And in the middle, right here, there's something else. Can you see it? Can you see what it is? A nail. Do you think I'm strong enough to pull this nail out? Anyone? You know, I'm pretty strong. Think I'm strong enough? Let's try it. can't do it. Sorry to those of you that believed in me. I can't pull that out. I'm too strong. I, I just don't have it in me. You know, when we come across something that we feel like we just, we just can't do, we're just not strong enough, you know, sometimes it helps to ask for help. We can ask for help from our family, our friends, teachers, our pastors. And sometimes it helps to try something else. Instead of just pulling the nail, what, what might else I try? Well, I do have this hammer here with a claw. 
You know, today's scripture talks about how there are times where we feel depleted. There are times where we feel scared and anxious. There's times where we just don't feel strong enough. And one of the things that we can try is to pray. One of the things we can try is to talk to God. One of the things we can do, it talks about, is put on an armor of God. It's like uh, putting on a coat of God, reminding ourselves of the love and the comfort that we can have with God's Spirit. What do you think will happen if I try to use the claw here? Well, let's see. I did it! You know, that was actually pretty easy. You know, sometimes when we confront situations that are hard, it helps for us to see it a different way, to change our perspective, to see what tools and resources we might have around us that can help. And of course, to pray. And to remind ourselves of how much God loves us. All right, I think it's time to pray now. Let's pray. God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for our church, for our community of support. And we give thanks for your love. May that love continue to surround us and inspire us and give us strength in those moments where we feel like we have none and to help us to see things from a different perspective, from different sides of the story and figure out a way through, a way of hope, a way of peace, a way of comfort. In your name we ask and pray all these things. Amen. Okay, friends, and now I invite you to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Good morning. Greetings and felicitations. Thank you all so much for viewing this Garnsdale Congregational Church service where all are welcome. My name is Tegan Lee. I'm a 25-year participant in the congregation activities within the sacred precinct, our blessed sanctuary, and God's house collectively comprising Scarsdale Congregational Church. Psalm 84 was composed by David, the Lord's anointed at a time when he was exiled from Jerusalem. The psalm seems to describe the privilege of those who dwell in the sacred precincts, the blessedness of those who make pilgrimages to the sanctuary, and the connections of worshiping in God's temple. However, David goes on to say that even those deprived of these physical locations can still put their trust in God. Now on to the specific text of Psalm 84 from the New Revised Edition Bible. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. May soul longs. Indeed, it's faint for the courts of the law. My heart and my flesh sing for the joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise, Salah. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pool. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Salah. Behold our shield, O Lord. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. 
Good morning, friends. It is a joy and a pleasure to be back in the pulpit after a few weeks off. We will have a guest next week and then our own Reverend Joya will be preaching before I bring it back home for our Welcome Back Sunday. And if you read E! News this past week, you know that my sermon today will have a reference to a wonderful cultural icon, Miss Aretha Franklin. So I invite you now to join with me in prayer. From the moment I wake up, before I put on my makeup, I say a little prayer for you. Just kidding. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for this day. Thank you for all of the wonder and the splendor of your creation. God, we know that this is a time of unrest in this world. We ask that you bless us with understanding as we attempt to learn and be aware of the unrest. Help us to be peacemakers, help us to be lovers of all people, and help us to be your beloved children doing your work in this world. It's in your son's holy and precious name that we pray, amen. The first century followers of Jesus in Ephesus were in a fight for their very lives. The Roman Empire lorded all of their oppressive weight of their imperial power over the Ephesians. They were to be poor and compliant, tax-remitting subjects, and that's it. When uprisings threatened anywhere in the far-flung empire, Rome did not hesitate to send in the troops, and that is exactly what we are seeing in our scripture passage from Ephesians today. The Ephesians experienced this system of domination and subjugation as pervasive and overwhelming as an embodiment of, quote, the spiritual forces of evil, which is what we see in verse 12. Therefore, it's not surprising that the author of the Ephesian epistle used military language and imagery to encourage this church, which was under siege. The scripture says, take up the whole armor of God, fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As for shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith, put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now this may be military imagery, which is something that I really, really struggle with, especially as we witness what is happening in Afghanistan and across the world. So for today, I'd like to propose a reframe. Let's look at the armor of God as they represent a reversal of all of the weapons by which the Roman Empire maintained their power. In defending themselves, the Ephesians would choose righteous weapons, not physical ones. So the Ephesians were encouraged, in a sense, to fasten the belt of truth around their waist, not a belt of lies. They put on a breastplate of righteousness, not one of oppression. They dressed to share the gospel of peace, not a gospel of violence. They carry a shield of faith, not a shield that was meant to encourage fear. And they don a helmet of healing, not a helmet of imperialism, occupation, or domination. This, author, this armor that the author describes was designed for active, nonviolent resistors. A breastplate and a shield, it should be noticed, they only protect your front side. They don't protect your backside. So retreat will leave you vulnerable. So this Ephesians imagery of only covering the front was almost a throw-it-in-your-face attitude to the Romans. They were being fearless, saying, we will take on this oppression head on. And holy fearlessness is a word that I would use to describe a hero in my life, and one that I had a crazy chance encounter with many years ago. Three years ago this past week, Aretha Franklin died in Detroit, Michigan at the age of 76. Now she was the daughter of a great civil rights activist and preacher, C.L. Franklin who led the New Bethel Baptist Church in Detroit. Miss Aretha got her start singing in church as a child. Her father, as an activist and a Christian, 
Welcome Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Mahalia Jackson, and other civil rights icons into their home and into their church when they were growing up. So she was surrounded by great leaders and people of faith who put on this metaphorical armor every day to go out and fight for civil rights. Now today, Ms. Franklin is known as the first woman who was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and she is the undisputed Queen of Soul. In fact, Aretha defined the age of soul music in the 1960s and 1970s. But it's interesting to note that her most successful work took her back to her roots. Aretha's live album, Amazing Grace, was recorded at the New Temple Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles in 1972. And it is a landmark example of Christian faith in musical form. It also happens to be the best-selling live gospel album of all time, and it's spectacular. And a wonderful new documentary has just come out starring Jennifer Hudson as Miss Franklin, and I really commend it to you. I've only seen portions of it, but it looks to be wonderful. Now, during that original concert, Aretha boldly sang a song of faith and resistance, a song that she wrote called, You're Never Gonna Break My Faith. And I thought it would be good for me to share the lyrics with you today. In that song, she says, my Lord, I have read this book so many times, but nowhere can I find the page that changes what I experience today. As any grace, now, I know that life was meant to be hard, and that's how I learned to appreciate my God. And though my courage may be tried, I can tell you I won't hide because the footprints show you by my side. Now, you can lie to a child with a smiling face, and you can tell me that color ain't about race. You can cast the first stones. You can break my bones but you're never gonna break my faith. And hope isn't yours to give because truth and liberty are mine to live. You can steal a crown from a king. You can even break an angel's wing, but you are never gonna break my faith. My Lord, won't you help them to understand that when someone takes the life of an innocent man, well, they've never really won. And all they've really done is set the soul free where it's supposed to be. For those we lose before their time, I pray that their souls will find the light. And I know that the day will surely come when his will will be done. Oh, you won't. No, you won't. You are never, 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 never going to break my faith. Aretha's musical roots were in sacred music, and she kept her faith at the forefront of her life. As a result, her voice became a balm of healing because she sang whenever her country really needing her, needed her, voicing both pain and celebration in her performances. Aretha sang Precious Lord at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral and she sent him home to his God with song. She sang, my country tis of thee at President Obama's historic first inauguration. And in fact, she sang at three different inaugural celebrations. She sang the national anthem at the Democratic National Convention in 1969, which was a rallying cry for the civil rights movement. She sang at Super Bowls, she sang at college graduations, and she sang at sold out concerts. But let's not also forget that she sang about the most important thing that we can offer one another, and that is R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Respect became an anthem for the racial and gendered political movements of the time. And it was something that wasn't lost on Miss Franklin, who said of her signature track in her memoir, Aretha From These Roots, reflected the need of a nation, the need of the average man and woman in the street, the businessman, the mother, the fireman, the teacher. Everyone wanted respect, Franklin wrote. It was also one of the battle cries of the civil rights movement, and they took this song on to monumental significance. 
When Aretha's version of Respect was released in 1967, it both armored and empowered people everywhere who were treated regularly with discrimination and disrespect. And Aretha showed respect for herself by famously demanding pay in advance for her shows, which was a first for female entertainers. In fact, the respect that she demanded and commanded was both personal and political. When civil rights activist Angela Davis needed bail after being jailed for her outspokenness, Aretha said she'd go ahead and pay it. She said Angela Davis must go free because black people will be free. And I myself have been locked up for disturbing the peace in Detroit and I know that you have to disturb the peace when you can't get any peace. Jail is hell to be in. So I'm going to see her free if there is any justice in our courts, not because I believe in communism, but because she's a black woman and she wants freedom for black people. Aretha always leaned on her faith. And perhaps that's why she was so kind when a group of my friends and I, all clergy people, interrupted her breakfast one morning in Cleveland, Ohio. At General Synod in 2015, my friend Em and I accidentally stole Aretha Franklin's reserved breakfast table. We blearily came downstairs to have breakfast before a synod plenary, and it was pouring rain outside in the middle of Cleveland. So we decided to suck it up and pay for the breakfast at the hotel so that we wouldn't have to go find sustenance out there. Well, we had other friends that had similar ideas and as more and more people joined us at the table, we wondered if we might be able to pull two tables together. The restaurant was packed, but there was a table right next to us with a reserved sign. So we asked our waiter if we could use it until the people who needed it came and he said no problem and helped us to rearrange the table. And as other friends arrived, we were so happy to be able to sit together in warmth and in community to enjoy a little bit of sustenance before a long day. But soon another group arrived and they inquired with kind smiles and gentle voices about their reserved table. And quickly enough, a table was provided to make up for the one that we stole and both groups commenced on enjoying their breakfasts. But after a bit, we looked up and we realized that the other folks at the table were Miss Aretha Franklin herself and her bodyguards. We apologized to her profusely about stealing her table and making her wait to sit. Oh my goodness, did we feel bad. I still think about this. We told her that we were all clergy and we were there for a big event. She smiled and she said she was pleased to see so many women clergy. Apparently, she regularly stopped by this particular hotel on her way home to Detroit, and she generously smiled at this group of cranky and tired clergy who had unwittingly moved her breakfast table, and she offered us respect, even though we had disrespected her. Miss Aretha Franklin is truly an icon. She never lost her love of the church. She never lost her faith, although she had many personal trials in her life. So may we honor our God and may we honor the memory of Miss Aretha Franklin by wearing the armor of God, this armor that we call respect. And may we wear that honor, armor and show respect to wherever people are treated as less than sacred, including the people who are devastated by this worsening war in Afghanistan, by the people who are devastated by the earthquake in Haiti, by those who are being herded into refugee camps in the wake of war, and those who are being caged essentially along the Mexican border. Everywhere that one of God's beloved children is being disrespected, may we put on that belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and may we do God's work in this world to further the ultimate goal of complete peace and complete freedom for all of God's creation. So in honor of the passing of a great, great person, a great woman of God, I offer you R-E-S-P-E-C-T and God's grace and blessing this day. Amen. Friends, let us pray. 
holy and life-giving God. You choose us, you invite us, you call us, you feed us. In spite of the many ways in which we stumble and fall, the many times we choose other gods instead of you, the millions of moments we betray our promise to be goodness and justice and kindness in the world. Over and over, you remind us of your constant companionship. And over and over, you welcome our renewed vows to choose you and to serve you. We know the stories, O oh God. We can recount the many wondrous works and untold miracles that have infused our lives with your grace. Help us to draw strength from those stories. Help us to pray fervently for your world and all the people and places and beings that need your compassion and concern. Hear our prayers, O oh God, on this day for all those near and far standing in need of prayer and grace and comfort. Hear our prayers for the grieving. Hear our prayers for the doubtful. Hear our prayers for the uncertain. Hear our prayers for the anxious. Hear our prayers for the sick and for all those impacted by this latest chapter of the COVID-19 pandemic. Bless all who are sick with healing. Hear the cries of those who've been exposed and those awaiting results and for a world that seems to be getting sucked back in to yet another surge. We ask, how long, O oh Lord, how long? And we pray that our suffering not be in vain, that our hearts might break open for the sake of more compassion, realizing that we're all vulnerable and that in solidarity we find strength. We lift up prayers today for the people of Haiti as they recover from a recent earthquake and as they fight to regain some sense of political and social and economic stability. We lift up prayers also this day for the people of Afghanistan and for the too many generations of people that have spent their entire lifetimes in the midst of war and occupation for all refugees seeking a stable life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today for all those preparing to head back to school for yet another year filled with uncertainty and challenges, for children and parents, for teachers and administrators and all staff. We pray that your Holy Spirit continue to make a way and guide a way for learning and growing to continue and flourish, even in spite of these strange and unforgiving circumstances. And Lord, we lift up prayers today for these beloved members of the Scarsdale Congregational Church. We continue to pray for our beloved Pat Colella, for a hedge of protection over her, and for your healing embrace. We lift up prayers for Bonnie Mitchell as she recovers from eye surgery, and we lift up prayers for everyone that is taking vacation or simply trying to enjoy the last bit of summer over these next two weeks. May you all breathe deeply and find some rest. And we pray for peace. God, arm us with your righteousness, your truth. Arm us with the faith of the gospel, the gospel of peace so that we can Move forward with courage to change what we can. Let us pause for a moment to pray for those who have not been named, but for all that are weighing on our hearts in need of your mercy. And let us pause a moment to offer thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for all the blessings in our lives for all the goodness and the joy and the comfort.
inviting God. We choose to serve you and to love you. And we are so grateful that you first chose us. Amen.